Developing right now on Morning News Now, horror and heartbreak in Kansas City. Gunfire erupts at the Chiefs Super Bowl victory parade, a tragic end to a day full of celebration. We just heard a bunch of, you know, pop, pop, and people started running and scattering. Everyone started running out of the building, and you could hear people yelling, active shooter, active shooter. This morning, at least one person is dead, more than 20 others hurt, and at least three people in custody as investigators begin to piece together what happened. I'm angry at what happened today. The people who came to this celebration should expect a safe environment. We have team coverage from Kansas City with what we're learning from authorities. Plus, hear more from those who were caught in the chaos. Also this morning, Donald Trump back in court to learn whether his criminal hush money trial in New York will go on as planned. And in Georgia, a key hearing that could impact Trump's state election interference trial. We'll break down what to expect from both cases. Plus, here we snow again. The East Coast bracing for another round of winter weather. We're tracking two storms set to slam several states on the West Coast. And the bubble is back. That's right, standardized tests now being reintroduced to high schoolers across the country. Why some schools are turning back to the testing tradition, but with a twist. Good morning. Good to have you with us on a busy Thursday morning. I'm Joe Fryer. That's right. I'm Savannah Sellers. We begin with the latest on that deadly mass shooting in Kansas City. At least one person was killed and more than 20 others hurt, including nearly a dozen children. And the biggest question this morning is why? Video captured the moment when the celebration turned into chaos as hundreds of thousands of people scattered following a hail of gunfire. We just dropped down to the ground. My daughter tried to climb on top of me to protect me. And I tried to just hold her so nothing would happen to her. Amid the panic, officers were able to take two people into custody while fans appeared to tackle and pin down a third suspect. According to the Gun Violence Archive, yesterday's shooting was the 49th mass shooting in the U.S. this year. Parades, rallies, schools, movies, it seems like almost nothing is safe. And we had hundreds of law enforcement there working hard today. But in a matter of seconds, someone who wants to disrupt anything can change not just one life or two lives, but almost two dozen. We have full team coverage of this story. In just a moment, we're going to speak with Melissa Clarity. She was at the parade and ran from the gunfire with her 16-year-old daughter. Let's begin, though, with NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber, who is in Kansas City this morning. So, Ellison, what's the latest on the investigation? Joe, right now, police say there have been at least 22 people who were shot in this incident, and there has been at least one confirmed fatality. One thing they keep cautioning is that this is still a very fluid situation. Those numbers, they could possibly change again. The fire chief for Kansas City says when they immediately responded to this event, at least eight of those gunshot victims were determined to have what they considered immediately life-threatening injuries. Of those 22 people who were shot, at least nine were children. In a statement provided to to NBC News, a spokesperson for Children's Mercy Hospital said they treated 12 patients. 11 were children between the ages of 6 and 15. They say nine of the 12 children had been shot, but all of them right now, they say, are expected to recover. The big question, of course, is who did this and why? Police say they have three people currently in custody. They're describing them as detained and under investigation, but they really want to hear more more from the public. They say the scene here right now is considered clear, meaning that it's safe, but it's still in the very early stages of the investigation. They're trying to collect physical evidence as well as massive amounts of digital evidence. They keep asking anyone who was here who saw something or who heard something or has any sort of video to reach out to them and give them that information so they can work to piece together exactly why and how all of this happened. One thing to remember is this was 
an incredibly uh, busy uh, event. There were over 800 law enforcement uh, people on the ground when this took place. The mayor has described it as something where there were people, there were eyes not only on the ground, but also in the air. And this still happened. But in terms of the investigation, it's still very much ongoing. We know three people are in custody and currently under investigation. Joe, Savannah. Ellison, overnight uh, we learned the identity of the woman who was killed in the shooting. What do we know at this point? Yeah, so we found out from a local radio station, KKFI, that one of their DJs, Lisa Lopez Glavin, was confirmed, they say, by her family and others to have been uh, someone who was shot and killed at the parade. She was a mother. She had two adult children. They say she hosted a really popular radio station called Taste of Tejano. Uh, her bio on their website describes her as someone who loved music. They say people tuned into her show because it gave them a mental break and in some ways it was therapy for them. I want to read to you some of the statement from her station KKFI. They said this quote it is with sincere sadness and an extremely heavy and broken heart that we let our community know that KKFI DJ Lisa Lopez Glavin host of Taste of Tejano lost her life in the Kansas in the shooting at the Kansas City Chiefs rally. Our hearts and prayers are with her family. Uh, as friends and family start to talk uh, there's local reporting that just describes as someone who was absolutely full of life. They say she was at this parade because her son was a huge fan of the Kansas City Chiefs. They, like so many others, came here thinking that they were going to have a beautiful day, one of celebration, good memories with their friends and loved ones, and it turned into anything but that. Savannah, yeah. Joe? I mean, Ellison, that's what hundreds of thousands of people thought they were doing, was celebrating this win. What are we hearing from the NFL and from the Kansas City Chiefs? Yeah, I mean, they've released a number of statements echoing what we've heard from so many law, of, law enforcement officials, that they're heartbroken by what happened here. And we've heard that from star players on the Kansas City Chiefs. We've heard that from the NFL. Uh, they keep reiterating that this is something they feel like it shouldn't have happened. We know it shouldn't have happened, but it did. And they say their support and love is with the victims and also with law enforcement as they continue to investigate this. All Joe right. Savannah. Ellison Barber in Kansas City. Ellison, thank you so much. Let's now bring in Melissa Clarity. She was forced to run for cover with her 16-year-old daughter when the shooting started. Melissa, thank you so much for being here. We are so glad you and your daughter are safe. Obviously, we can't imagine what this experience must have been like for you both, but just first tell us, how are you feeling this morning? Um, still processing this morning. Uh, I really didn't get any sleep last night, so it's kind of just been a really long day. <laughs> We can understand that. If you don't mind, take us back to yesterday, just the atmosphere and what you saw and what was going through your mind once you realized that there was a shooting happening. Um, honestly, I'm not sure what was going through my mind. Um, you know, it, it was a great parade. It was a great rally. The problem is that it was over. And so everybody was headed towards the exits. And all of a sudden, somebody start shooting it, it was terrifying it was shocking i think we froze in place for a moment just trying to process what do we do where do we go and what did you do where did you go once you started hearing that um we just kind of turned around the other direction from where we were headed and ran away it we were trying to get back to the top of the hill where our shuttle bus was supposed to pick us up. How's your daughter doing this morning? And as this was unfolding, how are you helping her and explaining to her what was going on? Um, I think she's she's doing okay. She is she's a very strong child. Um, but it, it's tragic, and she is going to have to work through this. And I'm just trying to let her know that she's not alone. And we're thankful that we work among the victims. So many people are thankful for that. You are grappling with this. The country is grappling with yet another mass shooting in this country, 49th mass shooting this year. What is it you want people to know about your community? Kansas City is a very strong community. We are always together, no matter what. And we will get through this. 
Melissa, Clarity, we're so glad you and your daughter are okay. We really appreciate you joining us this morning to talk about it. Thank you. Please take care. The shooting in Kansas City is just one of several attacks that have unfolded during public celebrations in recent years. NBC News senior national correspondent Stephanie Goss takes a closer look at the growing number of shootings at these events. They're asking people to get down. They're asking Another city is reeling from a shooting at an event that was supposed to bring people together in celebration, only to end in violence. The Kansas City Chiefs celebrating a championship win, just like Denver this past June, when the Nuggets won the NBA title. Ten people were shot and injured in an area where fans were celebrating. Police said multiple weapons were recovered, along with at least 20 rounds. This unnecessary instance of, of gun violence um, uh, that occurred literally in the midst of thousands of uh, community members who were peacefully celebrating. Police say they believed drugs may have played a role. In recent years, holiday celebrations have also become targets. Like in 2022, the July 4th parade at Highland Park, Illinois. 15 minutes into the festivities, a 21-year-old man opened fire with a high-powered rifle from a rooftop, according to authorities. Seven people were killed and 48 injured. I think the problem is guns. I think we've got to get, you know, a strong uh, leadership that cares. In 2021, the theme for the annual Christmas parade in Waukesha, Wisconsin, was comfort and joy. But a man with a long history of mental illness slammed his car into the crowd. Six people were killed and over 60 injured, some critically. Large outdoor gatherings are complicated events to secure, made more difficult by the prospect of people being armed in the crowds. We were here for a safe celebration. And because of two bad actors or more, it is why we're standing here today. Our thanks to Stephanie Gosk for that report. Well, former President Trump is expected to attend a hearing today here in New York in the criminal hush money case against him. We expect to learn more details about the upcoming trial against the former president, including a potential timetable for the case. At the moment, the trial is scheduled to begin on March 25th. Trump is accused of falsifying business records in connection to hush money payments made to adult film star Stormy Daniels. During his 2016 presidential bid, he has pleaded not guilty to the charges. For more on what we can expect today, we're joined by NBC News national correspondent Yasmin Vesugian from outside the courthouse in Manhattan. And we have NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos here in studio with us. Good morning to both of you. Yasmin, I will begin with you. Just bring us up to speed on this case and how we got here. What are some of the key issues the presiding judge is expected to address today? So... Essentially, today is addressing some of the motions that the former president and his attorney ha have filed so far, along with setting that trial day, right? You talked about March 25th. A lot of the folks and sources that I've been speaking to think that date is likely going to stick. It could kind of um, toggle one day or two days this direction or that direction. But nonetheless, we're looking at March 25th for this trial date. Also, the motion to um, dismiss by the former president um, of the United States and his um, attorneys, Judge Marchand, is going to be addressing that today. Court is likely to be in session just, just for a couple of hours um, this morning, starting at 9 a.m., likely um, to recess around noon or so. Um, and we're looking at that March 25th date. If we take a step back, guys, um, for a moment to think about how we got here, right, April was when the former president of the United States um, was indicted. And back then, by the way, it was history in the making, right? The first president ever in United States history to be indicted. That has now since changed, since he's been indicted multiple times since then. 34 counts leveled against him. The charges against him by the prosecution are that he essentially paid Michael Cohen hundreds of thousands of dollars and wrote it down as legal fees, when in fact that money was used to pay off Karen McDougal, Stormy Daniels, and a doorman as well for alleged affairs, extramarital affairs that he had, the former president has denied that he had. Um, we are looking at this trial date and the likelihood of this trial going on for a month, five or six weeks. And let me just say this, this is a criminal case. This is not a civil case. For instance, the E. Jean Carroll case that we watched just around the corner in which the former president has to pay out $83 million. He's gonna have to be here every single day. Today is voluntary, but once this trial gets up and going, he's going to have to be here every single day for that inside, of course, of this primary calendar. 
So, Danny, let's bring you in here. As Yasmin mentioned, it's been 10 months since this indictment. Trump has called this a political prosecution. What does it prosecutors have to do to prove this is not a political prosecution to, to win this case? They don't necessarily need to prove that. The argument is selective prosecution. I've made the argument myself. It never wins. Uh, you can only find maybe a handful of cases where it does work because when you think about it, all prosecution is selective. Prosecutors have limited resources. They select who to prosecute. It's akin to saying, hey, that guy over there is doing the same thing. Why don't you go prosecute him? As we know, in families with kids, that argument doesn't work. And similarly, in court, that doesn't work. Trump makes some other arguments, for example, that the checks he wrote were personal, and therefore these are not business records uh, within the meaning of the law. He, that will likely not work. Also, he argues that uh, pre-indictment delay, in other words, prosecutors waited too long to bring this case. They knew about it years ago, and they waited and sat on it, and that delay, and I can tell you, it does prejudice a defendant if a prosecutor waits for decades to bring, say, a murder case after witnesses have gone away and died and disappeared. Uh, I've made that argument myself when the government has brought a ca uh, case decades decades after the alleged conduct. So that is not likely to win here, where we're only talking about maybe a handful of years, and when Trump lived outside of the jurisdiction, which effectively tolls, pauses the statute of limitations. Yasmin, this case is one of several legal fights that Trump is facing simultaneously. Yeah. For example, in just a moment, we're going to switch gears and talk about what's happening down in Georgia. Compared to the other cases, how serious are these charges Trump faces in this hush money case? kind of mind-blowing, right? I mean, you, you and I, Savannah and Joe, have talked over the last couple of weeks with all these cases that have been ongoing. I'm, I'm looking at a trifecta, right? You got Angoron just down the street. We're awaiting a decision from him um, tomorrow, likely, right? You had the E. Jean Carroll case, two blocks over that way as well. Then you got the Florida Mar-a-Lago documents case. You got the Georgia case, which you just mentioned, which we're going to be talking about um, in, in just a moment, obviously, with Blaine Alexander down there. Um, You've got a lot going on here for the former president of the United States. This is an E-class felony. So when you think about this charge, this is a state prosecution. So he cannot, if he wins the presidency, if he wins election here um, in November, he cannot pardon himself because this is a state prosecution. And he is facing likely four years in prison if found guilty. So this is quite different than all the other things that we have been watching over the last couple of weeks. And, and comparatively, I think, when we looked at the big picture of this thing, guys, and we thought about which trials were going to go first, I think the likelihood was that we thought the D.C. case is going to go first, right, the Jack Smith case. But now we're looking at this case going first, the state prosecution in which the former president of the United States could be found guilty and facing real prison time. And so, Danny, the president, of course, did not want this to be in a state court. He wanted it to be in a federal court, tried to make that happen, didn't happen. Real quick, r remind us why. Yeah, he tried to remove it uh, about a year ago to federal court based on um, a, a very rarely used provision of the removal statute. Ordinarily, in civil cases, you remove cases based on other reasons. I've done it many times. But in this case, it had to do with essentially being a federal officer, being the president, trying to get it to federal court. Wasn't likely to prevail. It would have been a major strategic advantage. Uh, but, you know, look, going forward, you're in state court. The only thing I'd say, I have to agree with Yasmin, in that, I mean, whoever saw the New York case going mm. forward before any of the other cases. It's in state court. State court always moves more slowly mm. than federal court. I, if I would have picked this fourth out of four of the criminal cases wow. to go forward in timing, and here it is, it may go forward. But I, again, save the tape. Uh, even if they set a March date, things happen. That is a Latin principle in the law. Thing is <laughs> happiness. Right. That is it. <laughs> Gasman, thank you so much, Danny. You are sticking around for us, actually, as we move down to Georgia. Yeah, what could be a dramatic hearing that might determine the fate of another case against the former president is going to play out in a Georgia courtroom today. We're talking about the Georgia election interference case. Today, a judge in Fulton County is set to hear evidence about the misconduct allegations against District Attorney Fonnie Willis and Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade. Earlier this month, Willis acknowledged a personal relationship between the two, but she denies the relationship was improper and says it's not grounds for removal. 
Superior Court Judge Scott McPhee said earlier this week it's possible Willis could be disqualified from prosecuting the case if evidence shows that she benefited financially from their relationship after hiring Wade. NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander joins us now from outside the courthouse in Atlanta. Danny Savalo sticking with us as well. But Blaine, let's start with you. What exactly is going to happen today in this hearing? What's at issue? Well, guys, good morning to you. This really could be a pivotal moment here in the Georgia election interference case. And I'll tell you why. We all remember now that it's been more than a month or so since those bombshell allegations first came out. One of Trump's co-defendants, Michael Roman, alleged that Bonnie Willis, Nathan Wade, were having a personal relationship and that she was financially benefiting from that. Since those claims came out a little more than a month ago, there has been a flurry of just filings and motions and allegations going back and forth. This is the first time, however, that a judge is actually going to hear evidence. So this is kind of the moment where the rubber hits the road. When you talk about the things that has upended this Georgia case, or at least uh, certainly thrown it for a loop, and now uh, finally evidence will come to bear. So the hearing gets underway at 930 this morning. This is an evidentiary hearing. As for what we can expect to happen, it's first important to note the Ashley Merchant, the attorney for Michael Roman, says that she has witnesses who will, one, talk about the timing of their relationship when that began. I know Danny's going to get into that a little bit later, but also talk about what uh, financial benefit came uh, to the D.A., that's what they're alleging all along. Now, I do want to say that Judge Scott McAfee already kind of gave a little more stakes to this on Monday during an earlier hearing as to who would testify because he said it is possible that the DA could be disqualified if the evidence shows that there was a conflict or an appearance of a conflict. So Bonnie Willis did not want this hearing to happen. She fought to have it not happen. The fact that it's even proceeding today is already at least a bit of a blow to her, guys. Danny, as Blaine just mentioned, a key part of this is the timing of this relationship. When did it start? Why is that so crucial here? I said this weeks ago on this show that you go to any criminal courthouse in America and everybody is dating, whether openly or in secret. So that's why the timeline is crucial. If this relationship happens, happened after Fonnie Willis appointed this special prosecutor, then there's the argument that, oh, well, you know, we were just colleagues and then we fell in love as we were going over documents in this criminal case. But if it happened beforehand, there's an argument to be made that there's the appearance of impropriety that Fonnie Willis may have taken someone that she had a romantic relationship with and given him a plum job, a job that he's already billed upwards of, I think, $600,000 for. And then the argument is that $600,000, some of it came back to Fonnie Willis. It's really a kickback without being called a kickback mm. uh, that Fonnie Willis may have said, hey, I'm going to give you preferential treatment and then you and I can go on vacations together because you're going to get paid uh, by the state. Uh, it is a, a critical inquiry. Did the, rela the relationship already existed when he was appointed? That is a decent mm -hmm. argument. If it came up afterwards and then they became uh, romantically in intertwined after the uh, appointment, then the argument weakens. But uh, look, I mean, the judge already indicated there could be the appearance of impropriety. He's looking for that. So the defense here has a shot. Mm -hmm. Blaine, you already mentioned some of the people we could hear from today. Any other witnesses we're expecting to hear from? Could Willis and Wade take the stand? That is a possibility. And one thing very quickly, I want to touch on something that Danny said. Both Willis and Wade have strongly denied that there was any financial benefit. They said that they've split their vacations roughly evenly. Uh, so basically, they're very much pushing back on this. And Willis's team all along has said that this is nothing but tabloid fodder. So that's the stance coming from the DA's office. Now, as for who could take the stand today, both Willis and Wade have been subpoenaed. They fought to quash those subpoenas. And the judge on Monday said he's not going to do it just yet. He wants to wait to see what happens once this hearing gets underway. Way. So who we're expecting to hear from either first or very near the top of this hearing is a former law partner of Nathan Wade's and somebody who represented him for a short period of time during his divorce proceedings. He, according to Ashley Merchant, who's the attorney that's kind of set this whole thing into motion, she says that he can place the timing of the start of the relationship before they started working together on this case. To Danny's point, you understand why that's so important. So once he takes the stand, 
He's somebody that Judge McAfee on Monday, for instance, described as her star witness. So certainly there will be a lot of interest in what he has to say exactly. And then the judge will proceed from there to see who else needs to take the stand after that, guys. So, Danny, there's the timeline question, the money question, this vacations question. What specific type of thing would Judge McAfee need to find to actually say, OK, that's misconduct? And then tell us, what does this mean for the case more broadly, for Trump's election interference case? I'm glad you asked that question, because Judge McAfee doesn't need to find misconduct. He needs to find only the appearance of impropriety. Those are magic words mm -hmm. uh, that disciplinary boards and ethics boards for attorneys use all the time. It's not always when it when you were dealing with an alleged conflict of interest, mm -hmm. there doesn't need to be anything actually improper uh, for the uh, the job of legal of attorneys and judges and everything to survive. Uh, the view is that you must guard against not just improper conduct, but the appearance of impropriety. And Judge McAfee said as much. Mm. If he sees that there is the appearance of impropriety, even without anything actually improper, he may disqualify. And that has always been the standard. And that is to protect not only citizens, but the legal profession itself. Mm -hmm. All right. Blaine, thank you so much, Danny. We will not ask you to stay and do the weather. <laughs> you could, though. It sounds kind of fun. All right. There's more snow for the East Coast this weekend. Let's get a check on your weather. Hey, that's why we have Angie Lastman here <laughs> tracking all those systems. Angie, good morning. I think I'd really enjoy seeing <laughs> Danny talk about the weather for some reason, but I'll take it from here, guys. Uh, we've got another couple of storm systems that we're going to track over the next couple of days that will bring some snow to portions of the Great Lakes and eventually the Northeast. Here's the deal right now. We've got 17 million people people under these winter alerts. They are expanded uh, across parts of the Great Lakes. We've got some interior New England areas involved in those alerts as well. And you can see the system is moving right along. This is going to be a fast mover uh, over the next day or so. We've got the snow draped across uh, basically portions of Wisconsin, Michigan. We've got mostly rain for folks across Indiana and Illinois, Chicago, waking up to some wet roads this morning. But it's the, the slick conditions across Michigan and Wisconsin that you're going to have to be aware of here as you get out the door the early this morning. Detroit not in on that action just yet, but you will see that here as we go through the next couple of hours. And then it moves into the Northeast. We're going to see mostly snow for, for uh, this region, and it's going to be light. This is a fairly weak system that's moving pretty quick, so not a whole lot to worry about as far as accumulations are concerned. But we'll get another round of some lighter accumulations here as we go into the weekend, too. And that's going to be from this system, where tomorrow it'll be kind of centered across portions of the Ohio and Tennessee valleys. That's where we're going to see some some snow, some rain, a kind of wintry mix that could leave us with some difficulty when it comes to travel. We'll see some slick conditions on those roads from Cincinnati all the way down to Memphis for your day as you wrap up your work week on Friday. That'll race to the east. Once again, a fast moving system. It impacts folks in the mid Atlantic with a little snow and a little rain on the southern portion of it. Uh, but we'll also see some snow across portions of the northeast. It'll be blustery as well. So the chilly conditions are going to stay with us and we've got a bit of a breeze. So it will be a little bitter cold out there. As far as the snowfall is concerned, there's a couple of spots on this map that we're expecting maybe four inches, six inches, even higher than that is possible. Downwind of the lakes in a couple of spots. You can see the northern portions of the lower peninsula of Michigan could pick up some of those higher amounts. But overall, this goes through Saturday. You can see no impressive totals really for any of the major cities along I-95, even any of those major cities across the Great Lakes. We're not looking at a whole lot of snow, but it may make those roads a little slick. Meanwhile, out west, no surprise here. We've got another couple of storm systems we're going to track here uh, over the weekend. These are going to leave us once again with the chance for some really heavy rain. The flooding concern will, of course, be there. We've got some snow that we'll track too. This is tomorrow. The snow or the system rather will approach the coast uh, and bring some gusty winds with it along with that rain. You can see uh, from Washington down through California, we'll see some rain. The snow is going to be across portions of the Cascades as well as the Sierra Mountains. So that's where we'll pick up some additional snow. And then we turn our attention to another storm that arrives just in time for the end of our weekend. This is Sunday. It'll near the coast. Once again, more snow, more rain, and the flooding concern will be there because we've got anywhere from an inch to three inches, even five inches of rain possible for folks across this region uh, as we get through early next week. Guys, it'll be another system that's going to be difficult for folks there when it comes to the flooding, the landslides, the mudslides. We've seen it all so far this uh, many times this winter.
A wet winter for the West Coast. Indeed. All right, Angie, thank you. Much more to come here on Morning News Now. Later this hour, out of stock and under investigation. The critical shortage of potentially life-saving drugs that's now being looked at by federal officials. First, though, after the break, it's being called a serious national security threat. What we are learning, including a warning from the White House that's renewing nuclear concerns. This is Morning News Now. Welcome back. The White House is expected to brief top lawmakers on a serious national security threat later today after the chair of the House Intelligence Committee sounded the alarm yesterday. Sources familiar with the matter have told NBC News that it is related to a potential Russian nuclear weapon designed to be used in space. NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander has the details. President Biden facing calls to declassify details following a cryptic warning that there's a, quote, serious national security threat to the U.S. That ominous and highly unusual public message from the House Intelligence Committee chairman, Republican Mike Turner, saying the president needs to make that move so that Congress, the administration and our allies can openly discuss the actions necessary to respond to this threat. Four sources with knowledge of the matter tell NBC News that threat refers to a Russian military capability with two of those sources specifying it refers to Russia's military capabilities in space. We pressed the president's national security advisor you, about Turner's warning. Can you tell Americans that there's nothing they have to worry about right now in terms of what he describes as a national security threat? In a way, that question um, it is impossible to answer with a straight yes, right? Because Americans... Uh, understand that there are a range of threats and challenges in the world. I am confident that President Biden, in the decisions that he is taking, is going to ensure the security of the American people going forward. A top House Democrat is urging calm. There's really no cause for panic or alarm around this particular piece of intelligence. And this from the House Speaker. I want to assure the American people there is no need for public alarm. Steady hands are at the wheel. We're working on it. Two U.S. officials tell NBC News President Biden has been tracking the threat and directed his national security advisor to engage with top lawmakers. With a meeting already set, the U.S. has long been concerned about Russia's missile and nuclear capabilities, as well as its anti-satellite weapons system. There's no indication the intelligence behind this threat will be made public. The heads of the Senate Intelligence Committee say they are discussing an appropriate response with the Biden administration and urging caution to avoid potentially disclosing sources and methods, they say, that may be key to keeping all response options available. Back to you. All right, Peter, thank you. Turning to the Middle East, the United States is launching its own investigation into airstrikes carried out by Israel in Gaza and Lebanon. It comes as we learn more about a Palestinian-American teen who was killed in the occupied West Bank by an Israeli settler. NBC News international correspondent Molly Hunter has more. As Israel pushes further south in the Gaza Strip, ramping up its campaign against Hamas, the U.S. is now investigating Israeli airstrikes that have killed civilians, including the use of white phosphorus in Lebanon last October. The U.S. is reviewing the actions of its close ally as part of an effort to track how American weapons are being used. This comes as the conflict escalates across the northern border. Israel striking back at Iranian-backed Hezbollah after an Israeli soldier was killed in a cross-border rocket attack. And tensions also high in the occupied West Bank. In the village of Bidou, wrapped in a Palestinian flag, the funeral procession for 17-year-old American Mohammed Kadur. Don't be scared, his younger brother whispers. His family says their gentle, kind teen was shot and killed Saturday by an Israeli settler. One human rights group estimates nearly 100 Palestinian children have been shot by settlers or Israeli troops since October. A lot of people, they think the war and the killing in Gaza, but not. It's in West Bank, too. We met his parents, Ahmed and Hanan. Born in Florida, Mohammed was a senior in high school here. His 16-year-old cousin Malik was with him Saturday afternoon at a popular place for picnics. I heard gunshots, Malik says. Mohammed was shot twice in the head, the blood still on Malik's jacket. All our life has changed. We are not the same as before. Everything is different. U.S. officials visited the family earlier today. 
we're looking for justice. Do you think you'll get it? I hope so. We've asked about that incident. The Israeli military referred us to the domestic security services who have not responded for comment. All right, Molly, thank you. Coming up, permission slip problem. Parents of first graders in Florida asked to sign off on letting their children read a book written by a black author. More on the controversy that's sparking outrage far beyond the classroom. And pick up your pencils. Standardized testing could be making a comeback. Why some colleges are going back to the bubble, reinstating the SAT requirements. Next on Morning News Now. Welcome back. Parents are asked to sign permission slips all the time, but one such slip sent to families in South Florida is raising questions. Parents were asked to consent to having their kids take part in the reading of a book written by an African-American author. This all centers on a controversial Florida law that limits how race can be taught in schools, but some say these permission slips go too far. Jamie Garola from our sister station in South Florida, WTVJ, explains. This controversial permission slip making the rounds on social media. It was given to us by a parent who says his first grader brought it home for him to sign. The forum describes a read aloud for Tuesday in the library at Coral Way K-8 in Miami. It says students will participate and listen to a book written by an African American. It also says guests that may attend are fireman, doctor, artist. The parent telling NBC6 this is an unneeded process for our overworked teachers and can create more division among parents. School board member, Dr. Steve Gallon. I think there is a high level of, of ambiguity. I've, I've requested that the administration uh, solicit clarity from the state. The requirement was implemented to comply with the 2022 Parental Rights and Education Law and the Stop Woke Act. The Stop Woke Act limits how race can be taught in schools. Supporters say it gives parents greater control over their children's education. But opponents like Dr. Gallon say the permission slips can lead to unequal learning. The permission slips not just tied to Black History Month. The State Board of Education requires permission slips, for example, to have a Holocaust survivor or any other guest speaker who comes to the school. To what extent are we going to now have to ask parents to sign a permission slip? Is it because it's Black history? Is it because it's Holocaust education? Is it because it's women history uh, topics again? The district issuing a statement saying in part, we realize that the description of the event may have caused confusion, and we are working with our schools to reemphasize the importance of clarity for parents. However, in compliance with state law, permission slips were sent home because guest speakers would participate during a school-authorized education-related activity. Our thanks to Jamie Garola for that report. Now, the Florida Commissioner of Education also spoke out about this permission slip issue, saying Florida does not require a permission slip to teach African-American history or to celebrate Black History Month. Any school that does this is completely in the wrong. We are staying in school for this next story. Right now, more than 80% of U.S. colleges and universities do not require applicants to take standardized tests like the SAT or the ACT. But that could soon change. As NBC News Now anchor Zinkle SMA explains, some top schools are now way bringing, weighing bringing it all back. Pencils down, everyone. Time's up. Standardized tests are used to measure comprehension. Put simply, students answer the same questions and the answers are uniformly graded. The most commonly known exams, SATs and ACTs, are used for college applications. Why has it been important to create a standardized tool to measure academic competency in students? High schools are different, and so they need something to be able to compare applicants just fully across the board. 18-year-old Hadassah Jackson took both the SAT and ACT. I took the SAT twice. I think it puts a lot of financial strain on families with different incomes because SAT or ACT prep courses aren't cheap. Quick history lesson. The SAT was first administered in 1926. The ACT, its competitor, popping up over 30 years later. The exams have different scoring systems, costing between $60 and $90 with waivers available and are typically administered in person over a three to four hour period. But in 2024, a big change is coming. The SAT going digital on March 9th. The test controversial for some. 
We know that to be true. Students who have access to greater resources are more likely to score higher. Research repeatedly finding a correlation between income and student performance on SATs. The high-profile college admission scandal further highlighting concerns about testing disparities. It was the college admission scandal that brought down rich and famous parents. 800 families were involved and 50 charged, including actor Felicity Huffman. Huffman pleading guilty for paying up to $15,000 to falsify her daughter's SAT score, according to prosecutors and court documents. But lately, there's been a shift. More than 1,000 colleges and universities opting to be test optional before the pandemic, meaning students would not submit their SAT or ACT scores, something Hadassah Jackson opted into. When I found out that it was optional, I was like, okay. I feel like it opened a lot of doors to other universities that I could have like or that I can go to. But new research shows that omitting standardized tests from admissions may not benefit students. An internal study commissioned by Dartmouth finding that standardized test scores when evaluated alongside high school grades were quote the most reliable indicators for success in Dartmouth's course of study. Dartmouth College now reinstating their requirement for standardized test scores. I remember taking standardized tests and I remember not liking them at all. What are your tips to those who have to suffer or manage through them? These tests can be helpful, can be important, but they're not everything. I feel that your SAT score or your ACT score isn't a fair like judgment of your intelligence. I feel like intelligence goes so much deeper than that. Our thanks to Zinclay SMA for that report. Now, of course, standardized testing can be stressful. So if you or anyone you know is planning to take one soon, here's a tip. Experts remind you to take a practice version of the test prior. That can go a long way in improving scores. Coming up, a newfound love for an old arcade game. That's right. Pinball is making an unexpected comeback in a video game world. We will explain why next on Morning News Now. Welcome back. Let's get to some financial headlines. The feds are now opening up a probe into widespread drug shortages across the country. CNBC's Silvana Hanau joins us with that and other money news. Silvana, good morning. Hey, Savannah. Hey, Joe. Good morning to you. Yeah, so the Federal Trade Commission is launching a probe into recent shortages of chemotherapies and other drugs. The agency is examining the role of companies that help buy and distribute the majority of medicines sold to hospitals. It's specifically looking at whether those companies and the middlemen that ship them are misusing their market power to push down prices of generic drugs so much that some manufacturers can't turn a profit and have stopped production altogether. Only three groups buy drugs on behalf of most hospitals in this country, and the three leading wholesalers supply about 90% of those drugs. OpenAI may be the next challenger to take on Google search. The information reports the maker of ChatGPT is working on a web search product that would be partially powered by Microsoft's Bing to compete more directly with Google. It's unclear whether this would be a standalone product or part of ChatGPT. The development comes a year after Microsoft CEO and OpenAI backer Satya Nadella targeted Google by adding AI tools to Bing. And General Motors is expanding its hands-free driving system to rural and minor highways. The move will nearly double the Super Cruise Network by next year. The upgrade comes as automakers push the reaches of driver assistance technology to attract customers and generate revenue beyond vehicle sales. Super Cruise uses a combination of map data, high-precision GPS, camera, and radar sensors, as well as monitoring whether drivers are watching the road, guys. Right. Let's see how that goes. <laughs> Thanks, yeah, not Savannah. convinced on any of that. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Well, yeah. as video games get more advanced, some gamers are looking to an older form of entertainment, pinball. That's right, the analog arcade game is making a comeback, complete with leagues and tournaments. NBC News correspondent George Solis went to one of those tournaments, and he introduces us to a real pinball wizard. Chances are, you've never seen pinball played quite like this. The action at this pinballer's paradise in Wilmington, Delaware, so fast-paced, scores almost seem made up. A couple hundred million is a pretty good score on that game in general. So. Hundred million? No biggie for pinball prodigy and full-time college student, 19-year-old Jason Zoller. Playing since he was three years old, 
He is currently ranked the number one player in the world by the International Flipper Pinball Association, the governing body for pinball as a collective sport. Earning his title by competing in more than 240 national and international tournaments, awards on display at home where Jason mastered the game. See, very little effort and you got control like that. I'm one player in the world saying I didn't do so bad. That's pretty good. But his presence at this local tournament has some competitors ready to tilt. It can be intimidating. You, you know you're not going to have a very good chance, but you got to try anyway. If Jason is the pinball bad. prince. His we father, Steve, is the correct. pinball wizard. He wouldn't stop playing those machines until he beat every last high score that I had. <laughs> so, and I spent a lot of time on those machines. Likely why he's ranked 24th best in the world. Do you ever get a little competitive with your son? We're definitely rivals. Finishing in a respectable fifth place, his ranking unscathed. Jason's consolation prize, bigger than any trophy. One more game alongside his dad. Chase, you having fun? You having fun? I'm having fun. A shot this champion never misses. George Solis, NBC News, Wilmington, Delaware. Are you good at pinball? I'm okay at pinball. It's hit or miss. How about you? I did a story like that and found out I am not. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I had fun. We do We do like to play often. We do like seek out old arcades there and play. You go. So, there you go. So fun. All right. Our thanks to George. Well, coming up, a milestone mission to the moon. History this morning as an American-made lunar lander begins its journey to the moon. Get ready for liftoff. You're watching Morning News now. Five, four, three, two, one. Ignition and liftoff. That right there is this morning's launch of the Odysseus mission to the moon. The lunar lander, nicknamed OD, is on a historic journey to become the first U.S.-made spacecraft to touch down on the moon in half a century. It's worth noting that OD is not actually carrying a crew this time around, but success here could pave the way for U.S. astronauts to return to the moon maybe by the end of the decade. OD is now officially out of this world, so to speak, and is set to touch down exactly one week from today. Of course, if you're a morning news now, OG, then OD is right up your alley. You know, we love space news <laughs> here. Do that. Be sure to update you on this one. Savannah, you could say we are lunatics. <laughs> Too much for me. Too much. Thank you, Joe. Love a space story. When we end the hour, taking a look at one of America's favorite sports that is now taking parts of rural China by storm. Many of these remote areas were once never really heard of, but are now going viral thanks to basketball. NBC News foreign correspondent Janice Mackey Freyer takes us inside the basketball league that is dominating the Chinese countryside. <laughs> The hottest sports ticket in China these days is a grassroots version of the NBA, a basketball league where the players are amateurs, admission is free, and the stands are packed with every kind of hoops fan. It's a way for everyone to get together, he says. Played on an outdoor court tucked in rugged hills in Taipan, the self-declared capital of the Twin BA. Twin means village. For big game days like this, teams and fans drive hundreds of miles. The population here swells from 1,200 to more than 20,000. There are no big contracts or sponsorships here. None of the players are even paid. It's very special for us to like represent our village to uh, pretend uh, to show uh, show our uh, talent in basketball. What do you do when you don't play basketball? Uh, oh, I'm a cook. You're a cook. Yeah. American basketball has long been a fixture of small town life across China, but the Twin BA, with its rural festival vibe is now more of a national obsession. Live streams on China's version of TikTok, watched by millions of fans who had never heard of this village in one of the country's poorest regions. Now a whole economy has sprung up here around village basketball, even drawing the attention of NBA star Jimmy Butler of the Miami Heat, who appeared at a game last summer. I think it's great that we're exchanging basketball culture, says this player. It's a bridge and our passion. While village teams aren't professional, this is not your average game of pickup. They're fast and nimble, the crowd cheering every dribble, drive, and dunk. So with the crowd primed, the atmosphere electric, the championship game went well into the night here. 
was lavished not with trophies and rings, but chilies, goats, and a cow. Champions of the countryside and beyond. All right, thanks to Janice McEvoy for that report. Well, because the Village Basketball League is so popular, it is already expanding, adding more teams and even a Chenbiye hotel. Pretty cool. Very cool. Love look to that, get a in depth look at that. No yeah. kidding. <laughs> That's going to do it for this hour of morning news now. The news continues right now. Good morning. Happy Thursday. I'm Savannah Sellers. I'm Joe Fryer. Developing right now on Morning News Now, tragedy strikes Kansas City. A Super Bowl celebration ruined by gunfire after shots rang out at the Chiefs' victory parade yesterday. You know, at least one person has been killed, and officials say as many as 22 were shot. My daughter tried to climb on top of me to protect me, and I tried to just hold her so nothing would happen to her. Three people have now been detained by police. In a moment, we're going to speak to an eyewitness who was at that parade. More on what he saw and the reactions now pouring in from some of the chiefs themselves. Former President Trump is back in a New York City courtroom this morning. A judge is set to decide whether Mr. Trump will have to stand trial in that criminal hush money probe involving adult film actress Stormy Daniels. That's all going down as a Georgia court weighs whether to disqualify Fulton County DA Fonnie Willis from the former president's election interference trial there at issue an alleged conflict of interest. We are covering it all. Also this morning, the cryptic national security warning from one top Republican it sent lawmakers on Capitol Hill scrambling yesterday over what sources tell NBC News could be a space-based nuclear weapon from Russia. Later in the hour, it was a mid-flight assault aboard one recent Southwest flight to Hawaii. Now it's prompting a stern travel warning from the Transportation Department ahead of that busy spring break season. Good to have you with us. We're going to begin in Kansas City, where the Chiefs Super Bowl parade ended in tragedy. What was supposed to be a celebration is now the latest mass shooting in America. Police say one person was killed and nearly two dozen were shot, many with life-threatening injuries. A number of the victims were children, the youngest just six years old. NBC News correspondent Jesse Kirsch was covering the parade when gunfire erupted. He has the latest. We were out here with thousands of people watching as many were trickling away as the event was wrapping up. But we also noticed that some people appeared to be running away from the area as what appeared to be police officers were rushing in. And at that point, we knew that something appeared to have gone terribly wrong here. According to three law enforcement officials briefed on the case, this does not appear to be terrorism related at this point. But we still don't know why what was supposed to be a celebration became so violent. It only took moments for a city full of Super Bowl joy to be overcome with grief. We became part of a statistic of too many Americans, those who have experienced a mass shooting. Wednesday was supposed to be a party. Schools closed with almost a million people expected downtown to celebrate the back-to-back -back Super Bowl champion, Kansas City Chiefs. Kansas City, let me hear you one time. Right after the parade and rally, officials say someone started shooting. Video obtained by TMZ Sports appears to show the moment gunfire erupted. Some in the crowd flee as police rushed in. At least one person was killed, identified overnight as local radio DJ Lisa Lopez Galvan. More than 20 wounded, some seriously. Among those hurt, at least 11 children ranging from 6 to 15 years old. Something that was supposed to be so joyful just turned so quickly, and you can see some strollers out here. Some of the team's star players taking to social media. Patrick Mahomes writing, praying for Kansas City, while Travis Kelsey said he was heartbroken. As the chaos unfolded, Chiefs player Trey Smith says he was rushed to the train station and even barricaded in a closet with teammates and others. I'm infuriated. Um, you know, I'm frustrated. You know, it's supposed to be a day of celebration uh, for the city. Police say they've detained three people as the investigation continues. 
In this footage, parade goers tackling a possible suspect. Oh, we tackled him. We tackled him. Alyssa Contreras says her father, Paul, was one of the good Samaritans who tackled that person. She filmed the chaotic moments after police arrived. Some here outraged. I'm never bringing my kids to another place like this. I mean, there's too many people, too many children for them to just spread and guns like that. You know what I mean? The mayor speaking out. What you saw happen was why people talk about guns a lot. We had over 800 officers there, and I think that's something that all of us who are our parents, who are just regular people living each day, have to decide what we wish to do about it. In a statement, President Biden asking in part, what are we waiting for? What else do we need to see? How many more families need to be torn apart? And back to that video that appears to show bystanders tackling a potential suspect. Authorities say they are looking into if that is in fact what we are seeing on camera. Back to you. All right, Jesse Kirsch, thank you so much. We want to bring in now Manny Abarca. He was at yesterday's parade with his five-year-old daughter, witnessed the shooting and the chaos that followed. Uh, Manny, good morning. Thank you for being with us. We are so sorry that you and your, your little girl had to go through this. Mm -hmm. we're, we're glad you're safe. Just how are you and your daughter doing this morning? Um, I think I'm much worse than she is. Uh, I think I realize uh, the reality of this situation uh, and the gravity and nature of its impact. Um, she uh, was there catching confetti uh, one moment, and the next I, I was grabbing her and rushing her into a bathroom in an adjacent restaurant with players, uh, with members of the Hunt family, uh, with Coach Andy Reid. And so um, we were staged there. I, I thankfully knew that there was a bathroom downstairs, and we went in isolation. And I just told her, be quiet, be, be calm. And she said, Daddy, is this a drill? Is this a drill? And that, that that impacted me because the reality that our children know that this is a this is a problem, but the adults, legislators, the elected officials are unwilling to do anything about it. It's troubling. Mm. I want to ask you more about that in just a moment, just in terms of how your daughter was reacting. But before we get to that, can you just describe a little bit more about the scene as it unfolded? You, you mentioned where you ended up hiding, who you were with, but when did you know something was wrong and what happened from that moment until you were able to get to that bathroom? Yeah, the county was a sponsor of the festivities, um, and so we were very close. We were three rows back from the stage. Uh, we were rushed. Um, well, we were running um, into the uh, the area to the east of Union Station, which was our staging location um, prior to us trying to, to tra get transitioned over into a bus. Uh, it wasn't until the partition between what you see on camera now on the west side uh, kind of came down and a, a flood of people uh, came rushing towards us, uh, yelling and screaming, run, guns, police are coming. Um, and at that point, I realized there's a there's a serious problem. Uh, and I picked up my daughter because I had watched people fall and get trampled. Uh, and, and I rushed into the restaurant with the rest of the team uh, and others. And so uh, thankfully, we, we had refuge there and the gunman um, I think was kind of on the peripheral side. Um, but that fear is there in everyone's eyes. And I mean, it was hundreds of people uh, rushing towards us. Uh, sadly, one person, Lisa Lopez Galvan, was killed in the shooting. I do understand that, that you knew Lisa. What can you tell us about her? Lisa was a beacon of light and hope. Um, she was a local radio uh, DJ um, that, that hosted a show that celebrated Latino culture, uh, the Taste of Tejano. Um, Lisa is tied to a very civically engaged family um, that I've known for a very long time. Um, she's a mother. Um, she is a neighbor. She is a friend. Um, she didn't have to die, uh, unfortunately, because of the ease and access of guns in our state. Um, this is this is where we are today. Manny, you had mentioned your daughter asking, "Is this a drill?" Again, she's five years old, aware of training of situations like this from, I, I believe, school shooting drills. It, tell us how she's doing this morning and then what kind of conversations this has sparked, both during this as it was unfolding, how you were answering those questions about is this a drill, and now what those conversations sound like. It, um, it's sobering to have to talk to your kid about gun violence. Um, it's, um, she didn't understand it at first. It, um, 
I had to just carry on that it was a drill until we were safe and out of the situation. Um, even I took a picture of her dancing outside of Arrowhead as we got off the bus um, because she she just thought everything was fine. She had just been in a, a major parade and celebrated with her favorite team. Um, and, and when we got home and she saw the news, um, she finally got it. And she started to ask, how are people doing? Um, who's hurt? Our kids hurt. And she started to cheer up. So, so yeah. And as a father, you just ask yourself, what can we do about this? Is anywhere safe? You are actually a legislator for Jackson County, which is home to Kansas City. What do you think is the answer to that? The mayor pointed out there were 800 police officers there, and yet something like this can happen. <laughs> what do you think the solution is? Yeah, there were 800 good guys with guns, and still uh, we are tragically struck with nearly 11 children that were hit by bullets or fragments or hurt, uh, one victim that we know of so far, um, two gun violence. Um, we are a petri dish in the state of Missouri for bad gun policy. Uh, we have Republicans who constantly drive at the state legislature and supported by our governor even worse policies, testing out the limits of, of what we're seeing here today. Um, it's going to take local legislators like me who are on the ground in our cities and our counties um, to stand up and fight, whether that is through the legislative process or the legal challenge process, right? I mean, I, I reached out as soon as I was safe to our general counsel who drafts legislation and said, I want something on my desk Monday. You will have space in the committee. We will hear about this. We will talk about this in our legislative meeting on Monday. Manny Abarca, we appreciate your time this morning. We are glad you, your family are safe and we're thinking of your community. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Let's bring in NBC News terrorism analyst Jim Cavanaugh for more on this. Jim is also a retired special agent in charge and a former hostage negotiator for ATF. Jim, always great to have you with us. Thanks for joining us. So police, they're just beginning their investigation here. It includes collecting physical, digital evidence, interviewing people who are on the scene, witnesses, as well as victims. What are they looking for and how do they start to piece this together? Well, of course, eyewitnesses, you know, you have the, the one father who tackled one of these uh, reported suspects, uh, you know, on the video, he says, uh, you know, the gun came out of his hand when I tackled him or his sleeve. So there's so many eyewitnesses. There'll be plenty of videotape. I mean, if they've recovered the firearm, they're going to do firearms identification work with the laboratories to match, you know, uh, projectiles in the victims to the gun. They're going to have solid case on the trigger pullers or puller. We don't know if it's one or more. Um, and of course, they're going to find out motive. They probably already know what that is, some kind of dispute between, you know, local juvenile criminals or gangs on the street. It doesn't look like any terrorism attack. And I think we may find that there's a automatic switch on that pistol, a, a Glock switch, it's called, uh, by the number of injured and, you know, all the bullets, uh, 22 uh, people injured and all the shots. So we'll see. We'll wait and see. Be interested to see where the gun came from and what kind of gun it is. Hopefully we'll learn more details about the investigation today to see if we can find out anything more about motive and about the mm -hmm. weapons. Now, we also know, you know, witnesses telling me news there were no noticeable checkpoints at the parade. That's not surprising with, with that many people. Just how difficult is it to secure events like this? You got 800 police officers there and yet this still happens. Yeah, you got to secure this event at the voting booth when you, you know, everybody says, Joe, can this, how do we fix this? How do we fix this? The voters fix it by not voting for people who won't give us reasonable uh, gun legislation. Uh, that helps across all fronts. Uh, it won't help on every individual case, but it helps on all fronts. So we can reduce the violence. And uh, that's effective. It can be very effective. But people go in and they vote for people who won't do that. So that's the only way it really can be stopped. There's no event this big that can be secured by anybody. <laughs> All right, Jim Cavanaugh, as always, thank you for your expertise this morning. Former President Trump is expected to appear at a court hearing today here in New York in the hush money criminal case against him. The judge is set to decide on several key issues. Mr. Trump is accused of falsifying business records related to hush money payments made to adult film star Stormy Daniels during his 2016 run for the White House. As NBC News senior legal correspondent Laura Jarrett explains, this hearing comes as another hearing is slated to take place in Georgia regarding allegations of misconduct by the DA who's spearheading the state's election interference case against him. 
hey there. Of all the legal cases the former president is battling right now, the first one to make him a criminal defendant, the one that started almost a year ago in New York, is now the only one on track for trial, even as his grip on the GOP grows stronger. From a campaign stop... It's a lot of fun. I'm being indicted for you and never forget. ...to a courtroom stop. With a little more than a week until South Carolina's Republican primary, frontrunner Donald Trump this morning expected back in Manhattan as the judge overseeing the first ever criminal charges against a former U.S. president could decide as soon as today whether Mr. Trump must go to trial next month as scheduled. Prosecutors accusing him of doctoring his company's books to bury evidence of an alleged affair ahead of the 2016 election. So it's an election interference case. That theory put to the test today, as Mr. Trump has pled not guilty and seeks to have his 34 felony counts in New York tossed out. In the end, they're not after me, they're after you. The hush money case has only boosted his fundraising efforts, but his primary rival Nikki Haley tells Craig she still believes a criminal conviction would be no political asset. I know the American people are not going to vote for a convicted criminal. They're not going to do it. All while Mr. Trump braces for a different decision, civil, not criminal, with potentially devastating consequences for the Trump business empire. Having already found his company engaged in fraud, Judge Arthur Angoran now expected to hand down a long-awaited ruling Friday outlining what penalty Mr. Trump will face, one that could prove massive if the New York Attorney General gets her way. She's asked the judge for a $370 million civil fine and to ban Mr. Trump from the real estate industry in the state for life. Also this morning in Georgia, where Mr. Trump faces charges for trying to overturn the 2020 election results, it's prosecutors playing defense, trying to fend off an effort to have Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis disqualified over an alleged ethical conflict, a personal relationship with the lead prosecutor on the case. D.A. Willis acknowledged that personal relationship took place but denies that she ever benefited financially from it. And that's what the judge has said he plans to investigate at today's hearing in Georgia. Back to you. All right, Laura, thank you so much. Let's bring in NBC News Now legal analyst Angela Sinadella for more on this. Let's start in New York with the hush money case. What's happening here today? What's at stake in this one? So quite a bit, and it looks like it might be the first one to actually be on trial. So they originally set a trial date for March 25th, but out of all of the trials against Trump, this seemed to be the one where the prosecutor and the judge were kind of laid back about when this trial date would start, almost letting other trials to take the lead if they wanted to, not get that first bite at the apple. But here we are today, and the judge will be ruling on Trump's motion to dismiss, which is unlikely to be granted, and then moving forward to a March start date. So I know this can get confusing, but we're going to switch gears here, still talk about the former president and a legal issue, but now we're moving down to Georgia. So there's also a significant court hearing taking place today there. This has to do with the district attorney, Fonnie Willis, and the special prosecutor on the case and this potentially inappropriate relationship. Walk us through what we expect to learn today and how this could ultimately impact the case if, if Fonnie Willis were to be disqualified. So we expect to hear almost tawdry testimony of when did this romance start and likely hearing testimony from Willis and Waite themselves, but also the defense has claimed that they will put forth another witness who will debunk and claim that their relationship started way before in affidavit under oath, both Willis and Wade claimed it did. Now it might sound like it is just this romance story, but big picture, the question is, is there a conflict of interest? Did Fonnie Willis derive any personal benefit from Wade being on the case, from being from all the kickbacks, from the money, et cetera, that is allegedly what the defense has claimed is happening here. So if Fonnie Willis is disqualified, we will see delays. It's not that the charges will get dismissed, just more delays. And perhaps then it'll go away if Trump does take office. All right, we've got one more case to talk about. This is an election interference case, but it is the federal one. We know that recently Trump's legal team went to the Supreme Court filing an emergency application hoping to delay the start of this trial. Now we know that the special counsel, Jack Smith, seen here, is responding to that. 
What's he saying? How could this all be sorted? Out? Yeah, so Jack Smith is saying to the Supreme Court, if you are going to take up this case and decide about immunity, whether or not presidents should have no criminal immunity whatsoever. And look, we don't actually expect any court to ever come down that way. But Jack Smith is saying, Supreme Court, if you're going to consider this, do it fast so we can have this trial before the end of the year. And we'll wait to see how quickly the Supreme Court will even respond as to whether or not they will even take up this case. All right, Angela Sinadella, a lot to talk about this morning. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us. Now it's time for a look at your morning news now. Other cooler temperatures are on the way for the Midwest. Meteorologist Angie Lastman joins us with that and more. Angie, good morning. Hey, good morning. Good morning, guys. We've got some mild conditions for the southeast. We've got some chilly conditions across the northeast and the Midwest, and we've got some changes coming our way. So here's the deal over the next couple of days. These temperatures running well above average for this time of year. We are warm in places like Nashville for today and in, into the next couple of days. We're going to keep it that way here as we go through uh, at least the end of the work week. By the time we get into the later parts of of our work week and into the weekend, things will start to kind of moderate out for our friends in the Midwest. Notice we go from the 30s on Friday in Chicago to the 40s by Sunday. So we'll see some improvements. We'll become a little more tolerable for this time of year. Minneapolis will sit into the 20s on Friday. And by the time we get to Sunday, it'll be 37 degrees. So at least we'll see some nicer, more tolerable conditions. Meanwhile, though, we're going to pick up a little bit of additional snow in some spots, especially across the Great Lakes and the Northeast. Those are the two locations that we'll see impacted through the day today. We've got 17 million people under these winter weather alerts at this time, and those numbers could change here as we go through the day as this system quickly works to the east. It's mostly over portions of uh, Michigan and draping down into portions of Indiana where we see some of that rain, but the snow generally focused over the state of Michigan right now. We're going to see the slick roads. It's not a lot of snow by any means, but it is going to be something that will make you have a little bit of a slower go this morning and even even into the afternoon hours. As we get into tomorrow and even the later parts of today, we'll see that system work across portions of the Northeast into New England. It'll leave us with the potential for some additional snowfall across that region too. Notice those highest amounts are going to be downwind of the lakes. We see some of those uh, higher amounts in portions of the northern part of the lower peninsula of Michigan, but otherwise about an inch, maybe two inches for the widespread area across this region. Uh, not a whole lot to impact us here as we get into the week and beyond that, but something to, that might slow you down as we get through the next couple of days. Meanwhile, out west, the weekend's going to be quite active. We've got our next storm system that's knocking at our door tomorrow. This is going to impact folks from Washington down through California with additional rainfall. We know what a soggy winter it's been for folks out west already, so any additional rain could be problematic for the landslides, the mudslides, the flooding concerns, washed out roads, all of that stuff that we've seen over and over again so far this winter. We're going to pick up some additional snow. Great for the ski lovers, the, the snowboarders out west, the Cascades, the Sierra Mountains, all will have some additional snowfall as we get through the next couple of days. Uh, and you can see by Sunday, we're looking at another system that will approach the coast, impact folks in that region, and we could be left with some substantial rainfall amounts and snow. Here's the rainfall, three to five inches in some spots. We could see upwards of maybe six inches, uh, even higher than that in some of those isolated areas, specifically parts of California. We'll have to watch for the conditions to deteriorate there when it comes to the flooding and some nice snowfall for our friends out west. I know the Rockies will be happy about this. We've got another foot to maybe foot and a half uh, that could be out there here, guys, by the time we get into our next work week. Great, as I said, for those ski resorts. <laughs> oh, yes. All right, Angie Lessman, thank you so much. There's much more to come on this hour of Morning News Now, including a stern new message to air travelers coming straight from the Department of Transportation in the wake of that scary mid-air brawl on a southwest flight this week. But first, after the break, more on what's been described as a serious national security threat that's got one top Republican on Capitol Hill sounding the alarm. Those stories and more next. Welcome back. A top Republican lawmaker has issued an urgent warning of what he calls a serious national security threat. Three sources have told NBC News that it's related to a potential Russian nuclear weapon designed to be used in space. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles joins us with more on this. Hi, Ryan. Good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning. And this really was a cryptic warning by the chair of the House Intelligence Committee, and it led to a scramble on Capitol Hill. Now, officials say there's no imminent threat, but the warning comes at a time when several pieces of legislation related to national security are stalled on Capitol Hill. An unconventional warning on Capitol Hill. 
Chairman Mike Turner of the House Intelligence Committee summoning his fellow members of Congress to a secure room at the Capitol to review what he called a, quote, serious national security threat. Turner wants the White House to declassify the material so it can be shared with American allies. While members of Congress refused to share what they learned, three sources familiar with the matter tell NBC News Russia is developing a space-based nuclear weapon designed to target U.S. satellites. Satellites serve as a crucial backbone for U.S. civilian communications, navigation, military operations, and intelligence gathering. The sources adding the weapon is not yet operational. The White House is reviewing its options. We believe that we can and will and are protecting the national security of the United States. On Capitol Hill, members entered the secure space but couldn't say much when they left. I think I'll allow, you know, the president and the executive branch to opine about what this means. And while everyone agreed the threat is serious, they told the public they did not need to worry. I want to assure the American people there is no need for public alarm. We are going to work together to address this matter. This warning comes as a $95 billion national security supplemental package, which includes funding for Ukraine, passed the Senate, but is now stalled in the House. Republicans insistent they won't move funding overseas until the situation at the southern border is under control. But that's not all. The House is yet to approve the reauthorization of a federal surveillance program that Intel leaders believe is essential to fighting terrorism and helping support the U.S. military. Some members of the GOP believe the program encroaches too much on the average American's privacy. A planned vote for this week was postponed. And later today, the National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan is expected on Capitol Hill to brief what's called the Gang of Four in the House of Representatives. Those are the two leaders of the House, the Speaker of the House and the Minority Leader, as well as the two intelligence uh, ranking members and the chairperson to get more information as to exactly what this national security threat entails. Savannah? All right, Ryan Nobles, thank you so much. International headlines now, starting with the latest in the Israel-Hamas war. Israeli forces are now targeting a hospital in Gaza where they say some hostages' remains are being held. NBC News international correspondent Megan Fitzgerald joins us this morning. Hi, Megan. Good morning. Guys, good morning. That's right. We start in Gaza where Israeli forces have stormed the main hospital in the southern part of the enclave. Now, this comes a day after the army ordered an evacuation of thousands of displaced people who used the hospital in Han Yunus as a shelter. Gaza's health ministry spokesperson said Israel had launched a massive incursion with heavy shooting that wounded many of the displaced people who had sheltered there. Israel's army says they're conducting a limited operation after saying they received credible intelligence that suggests Hamas held hostages at the hospital and that their remains may still be inside. And guys, one day after South Korea's military said North Korea launched multiple cruise missiles into the waters off their eastern port, North Korean state media is reporting that new surface-to-sea missiles were launched today and supervised by leader Kim Jong-un as he warns of a more aggressive military posture in disputed parts of the sea. This comes, of course, as tensions in the region just continue to escalate. And guys, in northern Italian town of Ivrea, uh, there's this massive orange fight. And yes, we are talking about the fruit here. Uh, this is a three-day event, and it turns out this is also a tradition. Nearly a thousand tons of oranges were launched during an annual carnival celebration. Uh, it's part of their recreation of a medieval battle. Some 50 horse-drawn carriages transported these oranges into various plazas throughout the town where teams of people lobbed oranges at each other. And as you can imagine, uh, a lot of pulp, a lot of juice, a lot of a whole lot of things happening in this town. Um, but they say that this is a tradition um, that just dates back centuries. Guys? There you go. Ouch. I can't tell who's winning there. <laughs> that does seem like it would hurt. It's a right. substantial fruit. All right, Megan, thanks so much. Coming up, a scary mid-air scuffle that's now, you could say, giving a whole new meaning to the phrase fight or flight. After the break, the new message from the Department of Transportation warning travelers to be on their best behavior on board or pay up. That's up next on Morning News Now.
We're just a few weeks away from the next busy travel period of the year, spring break. Federal officials are using a recent incident aboard a Southwest flight to remind travelers bad behavior can lead to hefty fines, even criminal prosecution. NBC News senior correspondent Tom Costello joins us now from Reagan National with more on this. Tom, good morning. Hey, Joe, you know, we've seen this problem for years now, right? Bad behavior, unruly, even violent behavior targeting flight attendants and other passengers. This flight was going to Hawaii a long way when this fight broke out. And now the FAA says it is evaluating whether the individuals involved should be penalized and face hefty fines. At 35,000 feet, tempers can flare, and sometimes situations escalate quickly. Cell phone video from a Southwest flight Monday from California to Kauai, capturing two passengers exchanging words before appearing to exchange blows. The video shows others on board breaking up the mid-air fight. Southwest Airlines credits its crew and customers with helping to defuse the situation, writing, our number one priority is safety. This slow motion video shared by a passenger shows officers with the involved parties after the plane landed. Airport security would not comment, but Kauai police tell NBC News its officers did respond to assist, but no arrests were made. It is, however, the latest example of bad behavior on board planes. Let me be clear. The FAA has zero tolerance for unruly behavior. The FAA says incidents involving unruly passengers peaked during the height of the pandemic, particularly around the issue of mask mandates. Nearly 6,000 cases then. But while those cases have been trending down significantly over the past few years, flight crews are still encountering disruptive, at times combative individuals at higher rates than before COVID. How do you negotiate with and talk down somebody who may be uh, behaving badly or not behaving appropriately. The most important thing is we want to diffuse and de-escalate the situation. We don't want to make it worse. Violent behavior or interfering with flight crews can carry hefty penalties, fines of up to $37,000 and potential criminal prosecution. It's why the FAA has been pushing a series of memes as part of a social media campaign. It also includes PSAs warning passengers about the consequences. Sarah Nelson is president of the largest flight attendants union. Flying is not a right, it's a privilege. And we can only do it when everyone is playing by the rules. Yeah, importantly here, very often flight attendants say, don't make the situation worse. Try to be very calm with people, talk to them in a very calming voice. That's the flight attendants tactics as well. And they will, of course, they've been trained to defuse situations. But if they need help, if somebody gets violent, physical, if a fight is breaking out and a flight attendant is at risk, they need passenger help to contain that individual. That's a fine line they walk there. Joe, back to you. All right, Tom, thank you. Coming up, we could be just hours away from witnessing NCAA history. After the break, the college basketball phenom now poised to etch her name in the history books as soon as tonight. Stay with us. Welcome back. Let's get to some financial headlines, starting with some new data on America's labor market. CNBC Savannah Hanau has the numbers and other money news. Savannah, good morning. Joe Savannah, good morning to you. Yes, so we are just getting a fresh Snapchat snapshot on the health of the economy, the labor market, and the consumer. All right, let's start with jobless claims, applications for jobless benefits fall as labor more as the labor market continues to show resilience so we saw an 8,000 drop to 212 economists were expecting 220,000 meanwhile retail sales for January down 0.8 percent it's a much much bigger drop than the 0.3 percent expected and that loss coming after a strong round of holiday shopping in December all right meanwhile Elon Musk is moving the incorporation of another of his companies out of Delaware SpaceX filing to reincorporate in Texas where it has the majority of its operations. The move coming after a Delaware judge avoided Musk's controversial $56 billion pay package from Tesla. Last week, Musk said Neuralink was moving from Delaware to Nevada. Hundreds of companies have incorporated in Delaware over the years and it's due to the state's tax friendly status. And some Apple fans are already returning their Vision Pro headsets. 
and comfort is the biggest reason. And people have said the device gives them headaches and causes motion sickness. The weight of the Vision Pro, which is mostly front loaded, has been another complaint, and it doesn't offer enough productivity relative to its $3,500 price. Apple allows you to return any product within 14 days of purchase. Many of those who say they're returning their Vision Pro also know they'd be eager to try the next version when it comes out, guys. I don't know, $3,500 for nausea and a headache? I don't think so. <laughs> you can get that I, no for free. Thanks. Got to try it out, and it was pretty cool. It did give me a little bit of a headache. Oh, yeah. there you but go. it was yeah. cool to fun be in there. Savannah, so, thank you. Yeah. There's been an alarming rise of fights breaking out at youth sporting events, mainly involving spectators and players. It comes as a recent survey shows that sportsmanship is getting worse. Well, a Minnesota state representative, who's also a former referee, is proposing a bill that he hopes will stop scenes like this from happening. NBC News correspondent Rahima Ellis has more. Spectator brawls at youth sports games sparking new concerns over player and referee safety. Videos of the altercations racking up millions of views collectively. From chaos on the sidelines of a youth football game in Virginia to spectators rushing the field after a junior league soccer match in California, leaving two players with broken noses. To this brawl at a middle school basketball game in Vermont, a man with a heart condition who was involved dying hours later of a cardiac arrest. Part of an alarming trend in a survey of thousands of referees and sports officials in the U.S., nearly 70% responding that sportsmanship is getting worse. One state now trying to crack down on unruly parents and spectators. Representative John Hewitt, a Minnesota state lawmaker and former referee, plans to introduce a bill to penalize those who misbehave on the sidelines. If you come down on the floor and aggressively go at a player or a coach or a referee or a game official in any way, you've crossed the line. Just last month, two fights erupting at youth basketball games in Minneapolis. They fight at the game! Video from a high school match shows multiple people involved in a struggle on the court. And authorities say another brawl at a middle school game just days later involved up to 200 adults and children. According to the new bill, the state could fine people up to $1,000 for being disruptive or physically interfering with officials, coaches, and players at youth sporting events. One theory for the rise in violence, an increased pressure for students to earn college scholarships. That raises the stakes for both parents and players. I'm gonna make bad calls, I have made bad calls, but it's part of the game, and what are we telling our kids? But supporters of the new Minnesota bill hoping sports can continue to be a safe and positive outlet for children. Thanks to Rahema Ellis for that story. State Representative Hewitt says the money collected from the fine proposed in the bill would go toward hiring and training more referees as leagues across the state and the country are experiencing shortages. Well, Iowa City will be the center of the college basketball universe today as the University of Iowa's basketball star, Caitlin Clark, will attempt to break the all-time NCAA women's scoring record. Fans are traveling an average distance of 200 miles to potentially witness history when the Iowa Hawkeyes take on the Michigan Wolverines tonight. Here's NBC News senior national correspondent Stephanie Gosk with a look at the superstar senior's hardwood career as she closes in on history. Hey, there are eight points. That's all Caitlin Clark needs to become the NCAA all-time scoring leader in women's basketball. She averages more than 32 a game. So tonight when Iowa hosts Michigan, the record is bound to be hers. Every sports great starts as a player and then turns into a phenomenon. Tonight, Iowa Hawkeyes senior Caitlin Clark has the NCAA scoring record in her sights. She only needs eight points to pass Kelsey Plum, who broke the record in 2017. We play fast, we play fun basketball, and that's what it's all about. It's a milestone not just for the superstar, but for the entire sport. She is the total package, the real deal, and it's just so awesome to see women's basketball being put on this sort of pedestal. Part of the magic, the six-foot Iowa native can score everywhere on the court. But it's the perfect combination of pizzazz and confidence with the ultimate skill set. Her trademark is the Logo 3, a super long three-pointer. 
Famed Warriors guard Steph Curry says Clark's impressive whether she's passing or shooting, telling USA Today that's why she's such a threat, because she can do both, and both are lethal. Clark is such a draw, her games are even making big money. Everywhere Caitlin Clark and the Iowa Hawkeyes go, you can expect a sold-out crowd. Tickets to see her play are up 234% since she started as a freshman, averaging in the hundreds. And some of the biggest brands are inking deals. If I can sign with Gatorade, you can too. Now that the NCAA scoring record is set to fall, the excitement surrounding Caitlin will only soar, just like a three-pointer with a second left on the clock. With five regular season games left, plus the Big Ten and NCAA tournaments, Clark is also in range of Pistol Pete Maravich's 3,600-plus career points, the men's record that has held for over 54 years. Back to you. All right. Thanks to Stephanie Gosk. Thank you, Steph. All right. Now joining us with more on the legacy and story of Caitlin Clark is NBC Sports play-by-play -play announcer and reporter Zora Stevenson, who you just saw there. Zora, thanks for joining us. So it's been another historic year for Caitlin. Tell us just how she's changing women's basketball as she becomes this mega star here. She's changing basketball as a whole. It's not just on the women's side. Get this, uh, Savannah and Joe. She's the only Division One player, male or female, to have 3,000 points, 800 rebounds, and 900-plus assists. And now she's up to more than 1,000 assists. So many times we talk about the logo threes and her scoring ability, but she's leading the nation in assists per game as well. She creates and sets up her teammates in the same ways that she creates and sets up for herself. Um, it's shaping up to be an amazing, amazing night inside of Carver Hawkeye Arena. Only eight points till she gets the record. She averages more than 32 a game, right? So we'll see <laughs> if and when it happens. Caitlin says, hey, it's all about my team. We just want to win basketball games. When it happens, it happens, but um, you know there'll be some extra juice and energy in Iowa City tonight. <laughs> no kidding. And Zora, I understand you're going to be calling so the cool. game. So I'm imagining when you think of monumental moments, maybe we think of Al Michaels when Team USA upset Russia in hockey. Do you believe in miracles? Do you, maybe you don't have to tell us now you want to hold on to it, but do you have something up your sleeve for what you're going to say? How are you preparing for tonight? Yeah, I've been talking to a lot of my mentors in the business, and half of them are like, okay, don't predetermine something, just go with the moment. And the other half are like, all right, have something in your back pocket. So <laughs> I'm thinking of going somewhere in the middle of that. I, I played basketball growing up, played Division One in college, and so the little girl in me right now is a little stoked that she might be in the building for this moment. So hopefully I, I just react like someone who's in love with the game of basketball, just like Caitlin Clark is. <laughs> oh, my gosh. We can't, I'm so excited for you, too, to listen to you. Um, so four-time NBA champion Steph Curry recently praised Caitlin's game, saying she is a performer. For people who have not seen her play, like tell us what the draw is here, what it's like to watch her play, how she's gained these fans from all over the country. Well, we actually, on one of our Peacock broadcasts, we did the timing, the release time of both Steph Curry and Caitlin Clark, and they were exactly the same, if that wow. puts any of this into perspective. Uh, Steph Curry talking about her flair and her pizzazz. It's the confidence with Caitlin Clark, but also the consistency. She's shooting logo threes where some people can't even shoot, like, inside the three-point line at, at that same rate. Um, what she's been able to do and, and do it with the – utmost maturity she's only 22 years old and having to handle like she's like a rock star on the road I mean people are trying to figure out where the Hawkeyes are staying asking for interviews little girls are crying um and she's just handled all of this more than um I feel like anyone could it, it's a lot and she's still out there performing it's amazing what she's been able to do for the sport that so many of us love her numbers are astounding. Here's one that amazes me. She has drawn a 145% increase in away game attendance <laughs> to the Hawkeyes sell out their opponents' arenas. That's so that cool. speaks volumes. I mean, how do you put her legacy in college basketball when it comes to the all-time greats? Yeah, he, here's where, you know, Joe, where I, I'm conflicted because I, you know, I love this game. And, and so I, I want to have respect for everyone that's uplifted women's basketball. And so I think it's an and situation. It's not, you know, who's the GOAT, you know, on the on the men's side. It's like, you know, LeBron, Kobe, Michael Jordan. It's like, how about everybody? How about Candace Parker? How about Cheryl Swoops? How about Maya Moore, Sue Bird, Diana Taurasi? And now you get to add Caitlin Clark 
to that list and she's she's done it in a different way. You add in social media and the exposure of the game on, on national networks and it's just exploded and it's the result of everyone mm-hmm. who came before her who worked to get the sport to this point. And um, I think everyone's going to celebrate if and when she breaks that record tonight at home inside Carver Hawkeye Arena mm-hmm. and, and she's an Iowa native. So there, there's so much so context cool. and background to this. <laughs> really quickly before we let you go, if we could look ahead, the Indiana Fever, they've got the first pick in this year's WNBA draft is that the next step in her legacy yeah of course caitlin clark is is not sharing any secrets and and she said she she has a choice and she does not know what she wants to do at the same time she's saying that she wants to enjoy what is her senior season she has the opportunity to come back for a fifth year if she so chooses because of that covid year but of course the WNBA um is awaiting her arrival and they would love to have her uh the indiana fever had the number one pick in last year's draft Aaliyah boston out of south carolina so that would be a dynamic duo if you have Aaliyah boston down low kate Lynn Clark um, dishing her dimes and and scoring (laughs) from the outside. So as a fan, I would love to see it. But of course, we want Caitlin to make the best decision for her and her family. Absolutely. Zora, we will be thinking about you tonight. Good luck. Have fun. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. Big fans. (laughs) (laughs) We are back now with real underwater mystery that has even experts baffled. A North Carolina aquarium says that a stingray named Charlotte, there she is, is pregnant. But get this, Charlotte hasn't shared a tank with a male of her species in at least eight years. Aquarium officials say they have no clue who the father is or how she got pregnant in the first place. There are a few expert theories swimming around here, one of them suggesting Charlotte might have gone through something rare called parthenogenesis, which basically means Charlotte is an independent woman who got pregnant (laughs) all by herself. The other theory is that she did share the tank with a shark for a while. Mm. The team says she's expected to give birth in the next couple of weeks. A stingray shark? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Scary. It sounds How like, crazy is that? Sounds like a new movie. That is a, a wild Sharknado story movie. And one we will certainly keep you updated on when we figure out oh. who the father is. <laughs> right. Jennifer Lopez is making her return to the music world with a major splash. The longtime artist is releasing a new album called This Is Me Now. It's the sequel to her 2002 classic album This Is Me Then. J-Lo joined Hoda Kotb to talk about the inspiration behind the new release and the accompanying film, she says, is genre bending. I was very inspired to, to go in and make music again. I made this album, and when the album was done, I just felt like there's more to the story. Like, I don't want to kind of trick people into thinking, like, oh, fairy, this is a fairy tale. Yeah. You know, I got, you know, This Is Me Then, uh, the album I made 20 years ago, kind of captured that moment in time when I had fallen in love for the first time. And then, you know, some strange twist of fate yeah. plot twist happens and you wind up back together. And I was like very inspired to go back into the studio and make This Is Me Now, which I never thought I'd be making. And then when it was done, it was like this celebration of like capturing this moment in time. But at the same time, I felt like that's not the whole story. There, there was a journey in between there that was worth kind of exploring. I didn't want to make a, a music video or a no. collection of music videos, and I didn't, you know, it's not quite a fil- full-length film, but it's somewhere in between. But it's really just kind of a creative way of kind of depicting a journey that happened of, of, of what it's like to be a hopeless romantic, I think, mm. and that journey through life in, in search of, of love. I like the beginning because you say that. What you know? What do you want to be when you grow up? And your answer was in love. Yeah. Has that always been your? Well, it was one answer? of the first lines we wrote on the first day in yeah. the studio. Uh, that's in one of the songs, uh, in the title track. This yeah. is me now. You know, and and it's just, it's something I think that when you, I don't know, you're born that way. You know what I mean? You believe, or you're taught to believe in fairy. I think it's a combination because everybody heard fairy tales when they were growing up, but some of us take it so to heart. And I was definitely one of those people. <laughs> All right, during the interview, she was also visited by Carson Daly donning the now iconic <laughs> Duncan track suit in honor of her Super Bowl commercial with husband Ben Affleck. <laughs> JLo went on to announce she's going to go on tour this summer, kicking off Orlando June 26th. Very cool. Mm. She's going to do it for this hour of morning news now. Stay with us. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.